Come on, come on, come on. I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Keep running, keep running. Don't kill me, don't kill me, don't kill me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Drive Hayes, and this is Retro Review, a series where we take a look back and replay some of the best, some of the worst, and some of the strangest video games of all time. Drop a like on the vid and sub to the channel for more gaming content, and ring the bell so you don't miss a single video. A massive thank you to my Patreon supporters and Twitch subs who make all my content possible. Links to both of these are in the description below. Today, we're going back to the year 2000 and playing Time Splitters 1. The year 2000 saw a couple of first-person shooter games release across a few consoles. The N64 got Perfect Dark, the PC got Soldier of Fortune, and the PlayStation 1 got Medal of Honor Underground. Now, these games were all good, but they were also all very serious. A covert spy thriller, a gritty war story, a World War II drama. While it was great to see video games taking on more mature stories and themes, what would you do if you weren't really looking for a believable story? What if you just wanted a wacky time-traveling adventure where you got to shoot some stuff. Enter Time Splitters. Now, three years earlier, in 1997, the company Rare had released GoldenEye 007 on the N64, a game widely considered one of the best first-person shooters ever. Well, in 2000, several key developers left Rare and formed their own company called Free Radical. With the prestige of GoldenEye and Perfect Dark behind them, the pressure was on to create another world-class shooter. And Time Splitters was not only Free Radical's first game, it was a PlayStation 2 launch title. For this retro review, I went back and played through every level on hard mode, so let's explore what made this strange little game such a massive success. Let's start with the story. Um, honestly, what story? Each level is as video gamey as you can get. The campaign is nine levels long, and each one is a variation on go and grab an item and take it to a place. Try not to die along the way. Now, Time Splitters did go on to have a plot in its sequels, but the first game was just a series of levels spanning various time periods from past to future, made to be as fun as possible. There's no connection between the levels beyond the idea that aliens called Time Splitters will teleport in and try to kill you. Why? Who knows? Who cares? They're trying to kill you. You should try to kill them right back. Time Splitters has nine levels, an extensive arcade versus mode with built-in map maker, and a brutally difficult challenge mode, so let's play all of it. Okay, you've got your nine levels divided into three groups of three. When you start the game, you can only access the first group of three. You've got to finish all the levels in a group to unlock the next group. Each level has three difficulties, easy, normal, and hard, but if you want to access hard difficulty on the Group 2 levels, you've got to finish all of the Group 1 levels on hard first. Now here is an absolutely brilliant bit of design, a gameplay mechanic they've clearly carried forward from GoldenEye. Changing the difficulty actually changes the level. While most games would just reduce your health or give enemies more health, Time Splitters actually changes the layout of the level itself, adding bits on, removing bits, changing enemy placements, changing where you've got to go, or the weapons you have access to. It actually makes it a harder version of the same style of level. As we go through each level, I'll show you the differences between normal and hard mode. Now, each level is ripped from a generic adventure plotline, always being inspired by an instantly recognizable story and style. Before each level, you can pick your character, always a choice of male or female. It's purely aesthetic and in single player mode won't affect gameplay at all. We start off in Egypt in the desert, about to shoot our way past some guards and go and raid a tomb. Now, this game came out one year after The Mummy, so as far as I care, in this level, I'm Brendan Fraser. Now, this is an old school shooter which means no refilling health bars here. You can't just duck behind a wall and wait to be okay. You've got a health bar which will change from green to red as you lose health, and then another bar showing your armor. You refill both of these by finding med packs and body armor. There's also a soft lock on system. As long as you're aiming close enough to the enemy, the game snaps your aim onto them. On one hand, this can sometimes feel like it's taking the challenge away, but on the other, it helps keep the game super fast paced and exciting. The focus is always on the overall experience rather than the individual shootouts, and the soft lock helps, at least at the start until you get good. 
You can hold L2 to manually aim around. Some guns can zoom in too. The aiming system works exactly like Goldeneye. It drags the crosshair around in quite a floaty way. Because of how aggressive enemies are and how long it can take to line up shots with such a delicate manual aim, there are very few moments where this is useful. You'll spend more time getting hit while aiming than actually shooting anything yourself. Another follow-on from Goldeneye, most scenery blows up. Doesn't matter what it is, boxes, chairs, barrels, shoot it enough and it will explode. And the explosion also does that Goldeneye thing of lingering in the air a little bit too long. Along with shooting nameless henchmen, I hope you like shooting zombies, because my god are there a lot of zombies in this game, and any good gamer knows how to kill a zombie. Headshots. And you better get damn good at them, because if you don't kill a zombie with a headshot, it'll just get back up and chase you for the whole level. They also have an annoying habit of popping up right in front of the camera. Every level follows the same basic pattern, there's an object somewhere, go and get it, then bring it back to the end point. In most levels, the end point is also the start point, making them loop around. The end point is shown by just a huge red circle on the floor. They weren't even trying to make it something less video gamey. They knew this was a game first and a story second. The second level is a drug bust at a Chinese gang hideout. We are the detective, they've got the drugs, let's do this. Every level is timed, and once you know what you're doing and where you're going, each one shouldn't take you any longer than four or five minutes. Every level is ultimately very short, but getting to the point where you can do it in five minutes, that's gonna take some time. See, the enemy spawn points and item placements never change as long as you're playing the same difficulty. So it's a process of learning, it's trial and error. Memorize where things are, then run around like John Wick. Your chance of finishing any level first time is pretty slim, because the enemy love ambushing you, but once you've got the patterns down, you can fly around this game. Time splitters isn't easy at all. The enemies are almost as powerful as you, and if you lose a large chunk of health before a big firefight, one stray bullet and you are dead. And your own bullets can ricochet, so watch out for that. The second level also introduces us to the absolute beast that is the shotgun. This thing is so ludicrously overpowered, if you've got it, there's no point even thinking about another gun. Every gun in the game has two firing modes, R1 and R2. Machine guns can fire faster or slower, grenade launchers explode on impact or on a timer. The shotgun has a widespread or a focused spread. But the focused spread is so super focused, it's basically a sniper. You can one-shot guys from the other side of the map with this. But here's the annoying part. The enemy has them too, and they're just as powerful. You'll walk around a corner into a shotgun blast to the face more than once, and every single time, your health will go from full to basically none. Here's a cool touch. You can dual wield Uzis, but when you pick up the bag, that's this level's item to find, you can now only use one Uzi, because you're carrying the bag with your other hand. That's a small but really nice touch. Level 3 takes us to the future, breaking into a rocket research facility to steal a data disk. All the sets of three levels work like this. There's always a level set in the past, then in the kind of modern day, and then in the far future. You'll start with a sci-fi handgun and the proximity mines. Now the mines are great and all. Throw them on the wall, wait for an enemy to walk by, watch them blow up, but they're slow. So you won't find too many uses for them when the enemy just charges at you. They're great in multiplayer, which we'll look at later, but not that good in single player. If you stay still in time splitters, you'll die. The enemy may not be 100% accurate, but they're consistent and plentiful. You'll be dodging streams of machine gun fire, shotgun blasts, and rockets every few seconds. Thankfully, the movement is top quality. It's fast, extremely responsive, and very fluid. I played this game solid for about two days, and I felt in total control of my character the whole time. One challenge you'll find is the best weapon in each level tends to always start on an enemy somewhere. You want the minigun? You've got to kill the minigun dude. You want the rocket launcher? Go take down the rocket launcher guy. There's always a feeling of being the underdog. You're always punching up. Any weapon you get never gives you, as a player, the advantage, it just makes the rest of the level fair. Low health, med pack, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, god damn it, you will die a lot in this game. And death teaches you the level. And this means 
As you approach every new area, you feel a strange mix of wild abandon to run in and creeping caution to not die. You don't want to die, so obviously you edge forward nervously, but now you're so skilled at the earlier parts of the level because of dying so much, you kind of want to rush in to see how this bit goes. It's finding that mix of gently crawling forward and rushing in all guns blazing. Both of them work depending on how well you know the level. There's also no map, so it's very easy to get lost the first few times. Levels loop back, some are maze-like. You've got dead ends in random places, and enemies just love trapping you once you're penned in. There are spawn points where once you reach, enemies now arrive, and if you reach a dead end, you know there's going to be a squad behind you. Level 3 basically always ends up as a rocket launcher duel down a long corridor, and hey, I'm not complaining about this, this is fun. Next is the village. I love the design of this level and I hate playing it. We need to find a cursed artifact and bring it back. This level starts off with a super claustrophobic, tight city streets. Enemies hiding in corners, each house having an open window. Enemies can be hidden inside any of them, so you're checking each window, you're checking each shadow. There's an ambush here somewhere, you just know it. Then later on in the same level, there's long open sight lines of the coast running along a cliff edge. Granted, the water graphics haven't aged well, but I mean, you're not meant to be looking at the water. There's nothing to shoot that way. No matter what level you're on, grabbing that level's item starts the final section and spawns the time splitters. They're basically aliens that want you dead. Now, time splitters can teleport in basically anywhere in the levels. They don't have guaranteed spawn points and they're the only enemy that can respawn. They've got a massively powerful melee attack and a fast, almost unavoidable green ball of energy ranged attack. So the moment you grab the level's item, get ready to run like hell. Most time splitters will spawn around the actual end point of the level, so the most dangerous section of any level is always the very last bit. Now finishing a level also lets you see your stats, how long you took, headshots, accuracy percent, stuff like that. Next up is the chemical plant. Now you start with a sniper, so you'd assume you're meant to hang back and snipe things, but not really. The enemies will spot you pretty much instantly, and by the time you've lined up a single shot, you'll have taken a good few shotgun blasts to the face. Despite giving you a sniper, you'll often find your pistol with manual aim or soft lock is much, much more useful. The chemical plant uses the vertical design space super well. You've got enemies that start way above you, and as you fight through the level, you'll make it onto the same walkways you saw them on earlier. Each level may not be expansive, but they're all intricate. Each corner feels like a set piece. Each set piece connects well to form a super well designed level. There's no wasted design space. If you come to a corner or a stairwell or a door, there's something to avoid, hide from, or sneak up on. Every bit is fun to play. This is also the first time we get the grenade launcher, which would be brilliant. I mean, it's a frickin' grenade launcher. You'd expect it to be powerful, and I mean, yeah, it is, but this level also has the shotgun. And I mean, you can't beat perfection. One issue you'll have, especially on this level, is dying from seemingly nowhere. Enemies can be placed in the darkest of corners or the tallest of towers. And if you happen to run right into a shotgun guy, tough luck you're starting the level again. Onwards to Planet X. The plot is get a thing and take it to a place. Come on, you don't care about the plot, just shoot the aliens. On normal difficulty, you'll start up behind a waterfall and within a few seconds, you'll start getting shot at. Time Splitters knows if you spend too long standing still, you'll stare at the water graphics and they just can't be having that. This level has probably the most expansive single outdoor area. You'll be weaving your way through an ancient alien hive, running across outdoor walkways. There's no fall damage, so when you do fall back to the start of the level, and it will happen, it's not really an issue. Grabbing the item spawn in this level spawns like six enemies around you immediately, and shooting your way out of here will chew through your ammo. And while you do have a basic punch attack, you don't want to be using it, so spray and pray. God damn, one or two mistakes can take chunks off your health when the time splitters are spawning, the adrenaline really gets pumping. This game design really encourages speedrunning. Each level has an in-game timer and your time on each difficulty is recorded. I think the developers knew 
they were making a short campaign. So the focus was on making what little content there was as fun and as intense as possible. Now let's take a moment to discuss character design because it's, well, um, it's sexualized. Time Splitters is stylized. They went for the chunky look, vivid colors, jagged textures, and it's memorable. But every level has both a male and a female character you can choose. Here are some examples. You might be able to see that the female characters are quite a bit, well, less dressed. Graphically, it wasn't enough to just emulate famous adventure stories. They had to also adopt the stereotype of brave, clothed man and promiscuous, sexualized lady. I mean, it doesn't look stylistically bad, it's just... Why can't I play as a half-naked guy? I've got no problem with you clothing your characters how you want, just make it equal. Now on to the mansion level, and I think I speak for everyone who's played this game when I say fuck this level. This level is so insanely unfair, it's not even funny. The footage now is me playing this level on normal. If every level is a film cliche, this is the Teenagers Explorer Haunted House cliche. There's zombies, there's a boarded up old mansion, and the level item is a bag of bones. This level starts with you in a small, sealed room being rushed by zombies. If you're not ready, you can die in seconds. And remember, the only way to kill a zombie is to shoot its head off. Thankfully, you've got a shotgun. But here's a twist. So do the zombies. Most enemies in this level are armed with shotguns, and that means one wrong move and you can go from full health to basically dead. But here's a trick for getting those headshots. The soft lock system will always aim at the center of mass, which often pulls your aim down slightly. If you hold manual aim, it actually levels your gun at the perfect zombie head height, making those headshots much more simple. You've got zombies throwing grenades, undead police armed with shotguns, and machine gun turrets designed as deer heads. Thankfully, if you manage to shoot a zombie, even if you don't headshot it, you'll make it drop the shotgun it was carrying, which makes them much less dangerous. This is also the one level you will never, ever run out of ammo on. I am so low on health, come on. Oh, thank God, yes, a health kit. Psych! It was an ambush! This level does this about three times. It leaves med packs out in the open, but grabbing them spawns shotgun zombies right beside you meaning you'll often lose more health from the ambush than you gained from the kit. This is the most unfair level by a country mile. The random damage of the shotgun makes each enemy shot potentially deadly. You'll be restarting this one a lot. I mean, look at this. I grab the item and two zombies spawn that. I mean, just watch how unfair this is. You can't dodge that. They literally spawn right in front of you. The only way you could deal with this is if you knew it was going to happen. I actually have to backtrack the whole level to find a med kit just to deal with what I know is going to happen at the end. So far, I've spent more time on this level than in every other level combined. The enemy spawns are so massively unbalanced. How am I meant to deal with two shotgun enemies spawning directly in front of me? I've just got to hope they somehow miss. This mansion is just goddamn infuriating. On the upside, I'm getting much faster at the actual level, and I'm an absolute surgeon with this shotgun. I mean, I've ran it enough times by now. Grabbing this item really ramps up the pressure. Please, God, let me live, let me live. Come on, yes! Screw you, mansion. The next level is the docks. It's a more industrial espionage thriller, fighting your way into a military compound to steal a briefcase. Now, the docks puts enemies dressed in black high up in the distance against a black background. It's another level where we start with a sniper and end up using the pistol. I said earlier how enemies really, really want you dead, and I think this frame shows it nicely. Look at the sheer hatred on that NPC's face. Oh good, these guys have shotguns. Fantastic. Just what I needed. You fight your way through past all the snipers and all the machine gunners just to meet a gang of assault shotgun dudes. Grabbing the briefcase always brings us the time splitters, but this map needs you to run to a different endpoint. It's not a loop. 
So it's actually worth clearing the end of the level out of the regular enemies before you grab the item. Otherwise you're dealing with the time splitters and the soldiers and the sentry guns all together. And finally on to level 9, Spaceways. It's a spaceport. We need to grab our duty free and board the ship. I think at this point they just gave up even pretending to care about the plot. You start in a nice big plaza, taxis flying around and they can't hurt you, so don't worry about being run over. And just like the alien planet, you'll see these cool teleport in effects whenever enemies are spawned in, and they will spawn in a lot. Just because you have a minigun doesn't mean you're safe. Pinpoint streams of bullets are great at taking down enemies, but you'll need something explosive to deal with the sentry guns. Thankfully, your standard laser rifle has an alternate fire of firing 10 bullets as a grenade. This level is the first time I've actually noticed some audio issues. With so many laser effects firing and being layered over each other, it can distort quite a bit. I do, however, love the announcements made while you're in the departure lounge. This is a perfect example of Time Splitter's humour. It's very tongue-in-cheek. If you listen, you can hear the loudspeaker saying, Could the customers shooting at each other in the departure lounge please stop? I make it all the way to the end of the level and realise I have forgotten the item. Good job, me. The lack of any med kits on this level is brutal, meaning every single time you get hit, it's a major problem. Learning to clear the auto guns out first. These things will rip me apart if I don't deal with them. Grab the item, fight past the time splitters and make it out. Cue the credits. Now you might be thinking, oh that was short. And yeah, every level on easy or normal is short. But I wonder what hard mode is like. So I went back and I replayed every level on hard mode and my god, it is not lying. Let's have a look. Here's Egypt. You don't even start with a gun this time. You've got to punch the first guy and steal his. There are way more guards around the outside. The position of the guys inside is different and there's less ammo around. And then the tomb goes even deeper. You don't find the item in the same place. You now have to fight your way into the basement, past some even tougher female guards, through a room of pots, then into a large open room and jump off a ledge to grab the ank. And as soon as you do that, time splitters spawn bloody everywhere. Then you've got to fight your way all the way back out to the start point again. The Chinese drug level has way more guards, way less ammo, and an additional gun turret in the underground tunnels. Then grabbing the item just floods you with time splitters. One of the toughest parts here was this tunnel. It seems an enemy spawns whenever you walk over a certain part of the floor, but I had to keep falling back to hide and shoot, which means I kept walking over that bit of the floor and kept spawning more and more. The Cyberden just throws more shotgun and more rocket launcher dudes at you. I think it shuts a few of the doors that were open before, meaning you've got to take the long way around this time. This is a level that needs you to run ahead and clear the exit before grabbing the item. Because there is no way you are fighting both all of the normal rocket enemies and the time splitters and winning. The village loads up even more houses with even more shotgun zombies. If you can't see into a room or a window, there's likely an enemy waiting to ambush you inside. And in an awesome twist, when you grab the item for this level on hard mode, you don't need to go all the way back. It actually makes a wall next to you slide back and gives you a whole new route to escape, which is closer to the end point. But that new route is a small cramped room filled with respawning zombies. So it's not actually that much better. Come on, 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 God damn it, you'll be saying that a lot. The chemical plant on hard seems to have enemies that can see you through walls because as soon as the level begins, while still hidden, that enemy will throw a super accurate grenade that will land right next to you. Now this level, this is where hard mode really starts to ramp up. This is where the game stops messing around. The enemies here get way more accurate, far more aggressive, and there is no med kit on the entire level. There is simply armor that gives you 50% armor. Combine that with the fact that almost every enemy has a shotgun or a grenade launcher means you are one step away from death on any corner. How hard is this level? 
Well, I'm glad you asked. Oh my god, finally the item, and the end point is just through that door. All I've got to do is grab the item and drop down. As long as the game doesn't spawn like three time splitters right in front of me, I should be fine. Oh fuck you, game. Now, Planet X on hard mode is an absolute walk in the park compared to the chemical plant. Planet X actually starts you in a different location and has you charging into waves of machine gunning aliens. You know what? I don't even mind. I will take machine gunning enemies over shotgun enemies any day. Ah, uh, okay, maybe spoke too soon on that one. The layout of this level is basically the same, even has the same spawn six dudes in when you grab the item mechanic, which, I mean, after the previous level, this almost feels easy. Planet X goes down pretty damn quickly, which means, oh god, oh no, it's the mansion. Straight away, the mansion on hard just doubles the number of zombies. I think it might even triple it, and it spawns them in as you move in this small room, so you can't even herd them around. You've then got this extra guy on the grass outside throwing grenades and just so, so many more shotgun dudes in the tunnel. This whole level is basically the same with more of everything. More zombies, more shotguns, more machine gun deer heads, and more ambushes. Thankfully, they've kept the med packs in, but I mean, they're still just ambushes. Here is a brief montage of how my hard mansion experience went. Oh, thank god I never have to do that again. The docks is hard, but honestly, compared to the mansion, this is just a joke. Yeah, there's more snipers and more time splitters spawn in, but honestly, after dealing with all of those shotgun zombies, this is quite relaxing. And finally, hard spaceways. You've got some new enemies, more gun turrets, and more grenades flying about in general. It's an intense space laser battle from start to finish, and this time I even remember to grab the item before ending the level. I run to the end and... You are having a laugh game. So on hard mode, that final turret, literally right above the end zone, fires rockets. What a great change. So all nine levels downed on hard mode. Maybe that's the game. Maybe we're done. Well, not quite. You see, Time Splitters was a PS2 launch title. It needed something to keep people playing it, and it was made by the guys behind Goldeneye. So they knew just what to do. Four player split screen. Arcade mode lets you take on your mates in a variety of games. Classic deathmatch, bag tag, which is hold the bag to gain points while every other player tries to kill the person holding the bag. Capture the bag, which is just capture the flag with bags. Knockout, which has each team grab a single bag from the center and return it to their base. And escort sees you guarding an NPC as they walk very slowly from A to B or attacking the NPC, depending on your side. And finally, Last Stand, only available on a select few maps, has you defending an objective from waves of enemies. You can't leave the area, and you have to survive as long as you can. Along with having all these awesome arcade modes, Time Splitters lets you customize everything, from the rules and the parameters of the game, to the weapon sets you'll use, and the bots you play against. Yes, this game supports bots. And if you're not happy with the preset weapons or bot selection, you can make your own. Custom weapon sets let you choose who starts with what gun and what can be found in the level. Of course, true time splitter aficionados know the only real setup is dual miniguns for absolutely everyone. So you've got arcade mode, loads of game styles, custom bots, custom weapons. What else do you need for a night of classic deathmatch fun? Well, how about making your own maps? Time Splitters features a custom map creator, which for the PS2 was groundbreaking. You can place your own rooms, hallways, stairs, you can see which floor you're currently on and make long, complex paths that snake back and forth. Then you can customize the lighting for each section. And finally, choose where all the important stuff goes, like spawn points, items, weapons and armor. It's incredibly simple to use and so well optimized for the DualShock controller. This feature alone 
gave this game immense replayability. And then all the custom maps were saved to the memory card. So you could make a map, save it, take it to your mate's house and play it there. God knows I wasn't the only kid who spent many nights making badass custom maps for team death matches. The bulk of Time Splitters was absolutely the multiplayer, but everything for the multiplayer, characters and maps, they were all unlocked from playing the main campaign. So you had to play through. And then you've got the challenges. Good God, the challenges. So you finish the campaign on hard and your mates have gone home for the evening. How about some challenges? These were short, simple and super difficult tasks. Headshot 50 zombies within two minutes and you can't leave the area. Kill 100 ducks in five minutes. Hold on to the bag for one minute while everyone tries to kill you. I tried the headshot one, despite being good at headshotting zombies, can't do it. I could do this as a kid, but it's just too difficult for me now. And hunting a hundred ducks? No way. I managed the bag one only because I camped in a corner with a rocket launcher. Finishing a challenge unlocks even more challenges. There's so much content in this game, but my god does unlocking it take some serious skill. Everything from skins to maps to cheats. Yes, this is the type of game where you unlock the cheats, such as big or small head mode, or every enemy has a rocket launcher, through playing the game. And then it saves to the card, and everyone wanted to be the person with the maxed out Time Splitters memory card save. Now, graphically, Time Splitters was leaning into that chunky, blocky character design and quite generic but recognizable scenery. Even the PS2 box art of the game features all the characters in the foreground and a strip of 35mm film reel in the background showing that this is meant to be a film. Every level is a short adventure. Free Radical went on to say one of the hardest challenges while making the game was making it not lag while in four player split screen, which is why the four player split screen doesn't have anti-aliasing. They pushed the PS2 to what it could do for the time, and I think personally they did an amazing job. And then we come to the sound. My god, the music! When you load this game up, you are greeted with this brilliant mix of techno beats, epic strings and deep bass. It's catchy. It's memorable. It's a worthy theme of such a brilliant game. But then each level has a master crafted theme because each level only takes minutes to finish. The background music doesn't get old. Egypt gets this tribal drum beat and tension filled low strings. The Cyberden has the constant beat of electro and industrial. Planet X has drum beats and cymbals layered over vibrating alien tones. Honestly, the music just rocks for the whole game. The soundtrack was created by Graham Norgate, the same guy who made Donkey Kong 64, Goldeneye, and Perfect Dark soundtracks, and he would go on to work on both Time Splitter sequels and all of the Crisis franchise. I've played a lot of games as a kid, and sometimes I revisit them and end up feeling disappointed. They're never as good as I remember, or they've got glaring faults I can see as an adult that I clearly ignored when I was younger. But not Time Splitters. I remember this being an intensely short but very fun shooter, and that's exactly what it is. Solid gunplay and movement, varied levels and a kick-ass soundtrack make Time Splitters great fun to play solo, then you bring your mates round and spend the night in arcade mode, probably the best four-player split screen since Goldeneye. It launched with the PS2, and years later, it's still one of its best games. So for a final score, I will award Time Splitters 1 Overpowered Shotgun out of 10. Thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying revisiting Time Splitters with me. A massive thanks to all my supporters on Patreon and Twitch who make all my content possible. If you've enjoyed the video, you can join the Patreon from only one pound a month. Let me know in the comments which game you want me to replay next, and then check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter, and Discord. And as always, have a great day.